Dr. Robert Sapolsky, it's a real treat to have you on the show today. Well, thanks. Glad to be here. So uh, I've wanted to talk with you for a long time. As you know, I probably expressed that a little bit in the email exchange leading up to this podcast. And I'm, um, I want to tell you what my plan is for the day. And I don't know that it's going to actually happen the way uh, I'm planning it. But my, my plan is to um, do a little get to know you. I'm going to ask you a few personal questions, just kind of icebreaker. And then um, you can answer them however you like. And you're welcome to ask me any questions back. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, why I've been interested in your work for the past decade. And then my main hope is to really give some focus and time to hearing what it means to have no free will and hearing the story of what life in the world looks like when we accept that fact. I've found in other podcasts I've listened to you recently that there's a lot of quibbling going on with the idea and and I never got the full picture. My hope is on the podcast, you can give as full a picture as you want about what determinism actually means um, for our experience in reality. And then we'll come back to the objections and explore some other ideas as a way to close out. Good. Good. That's Sounds not great. you. Okay, good. good. All right. So uh, one of my favorite questions, uh, one of the best days of your life. One of the best days of my life, um, I went to, this was a year getting back from, uh, just after getting back from Africa for the first time, um, I was hanging out in Cambridge. It was an absolutely gorgeous day. Um, I was with someone I very much wanted to be with, and we went to an outdoor Bob Marley concert, which for my generation was about as good as things get. So that was wow. That was a perfect day. Oh, you got to see Bob. That's great. What uh, what tour was that? What year? I don't know, but the totally bizarre thing was about a year later running into a guy in Nairobi, a Kenyan guy, um, who yeah. had also been to a Bob Marley concert in Nairobi. The notion that we could have done those two things on opposite sides of the globe in terms of like yeah. global connectedness was pretty wild. Do you have a self-care practice, whether it's physical or intellectual as a way that you take care of yourself um, that's important for you? Oh, I don't know. Other than like being wildly intertwined with my wife and, and maintained by that, I think in every other regard, I'm, I'm completely terrible in terms of self-maintenance. I don't get enough sleep. I'm way too stressed. I'm neurotic as hell. I, I <laughs> don't put things in perspective. So uh -huh. I think collectively, I'm, I'm not a very good teaching tool. Appreciate your honesty there. Um, I have empathy for that too. Okay. Um, do you ever feel free? You know, since there is, uh, we're talking about not having free will. Do you have experiences where you feel free in life where it's like, I just, even though it may not be true, do you experience freedom? Yeah. And it's usually intermixed with massive amounts of gratitude, which is something I don't manage very often and which is a very uh -huh. good thing. The last time, a couple of years ago, my wife, our daughter, we were hiking in the Rockies and just this exquisite hike overlooking this lake and another lake above us and marmots yelling at us from everywhere. And just, you know, one of those moments of just like life was a very good idea. It seemed at that moment, <laughs> like it's really good that that randomness worked out this way. Have you ever had acupuncture? No, no, I have not. Okay. Okay. Is there a reason for that? Are you, are you uh, not trusting of the art or the science around it, or just no particular occasion? Um, I think basically no occasion. I'm, um, um, I'm willing to say it's a great thing and effective thing in some of my classes, but beyond that, I'm, I'm stunningly ignorant. Okay. Um, and then turning to the book, determined your new book, determined, which I've spent a month just saturated in um, so much so that I so much so that I had a dream one morning where I was waking up asking myself whether every atom actually matters or not. <laughs> That's 
sounds about right. <laughs> wow, so it was worth writing that thing for five years. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's yeah, good. so great. That's a, that's Lee. So, what is the hardest thing about writing this particular book, and what was the best for you? Um, hardest thing, well, naturally, it had subparts. Um, hardest thing was forcing me to read a lot of contemporary philosophers, because that is not my intellectual <laughs> strength. Um, which led to the next hardest thing. Uh, which was anticipating all the ways in which every philosopher on earth reviewing the book was going to hate it, um, leading to the third hardest thing, which is in the last month experiencing, yes, they all hate it, and putting that in perspective <laughs> and saying, well, you kind of asked for it, so like, this is a good thing rather than them just ignoring it. So I think those three parts have been... Have been uh, mm -hmm sort of fairly tough and intertwined in terms of the best parts i would say the first time i've figured out after four years of procrastinating on the ending of the book the first time that i figured out the extent to which no free will is good news rather than bad that was great that was wonderful if you have any questions about myself i'll do a quick introduction about how i got into your work but just to be fair well, how how do you wind up with your training and enthusiasm yeah. and I presume obsessions? How how did you how did that turn out? How do you turn into that sort of person? Oh gosh, yeah. Well, it, that's a good question, and it's a, I could do the long answer and give you the full map, but <laughs> um, as you get the joke. But um, I, uh, I when I was a young man, I got exposed. I had a friend. I was in a young adults therapy group. And um, I got exposed to a friend who was an acupuncture student. And he started ta speaking with me about Chinese medicine. And it was very fascinating to me. Um, I got interested in the healing arts of massage therapy. I think in large part, I think the idea of people being kind to each other and touching each other in a positive way was a good alternative to how my life grew up. There was some definitely some domestic harm you know, I, on the on the A scale, I identify with a four as a, my childhood experience. That's you not know? a good score. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah. It's not all it's not the whole story, but it's part of the story. And then uh, and then after I finished my undergraduate degree in creative writing and English at Sonoma State, I um, got in, into wondering what I was going to do next and ended up going on a what's called a vision fast or wilderness fast. And when I was out there, it came back to me. Chinese medicine had always been there. I love the human body, deeply interested in the human body. And, and I love stories and I love the poetry. And Chinese medicine had this beautiful blend of nature, poetry, healing, and body. And it, uh, it, yeah, so it came to me when I was out on the mountain. That was 28 years ago, 25 years ago, somewhere in that range. I can't remember exactly right now. And about 10 or 11 years ago, I don't know when the Nat Geo special on stress came out, but I found you and I found that special. And I was like, this is amazing because this is talking about primatology and this is actually talking about my patients, my, <laughs> my corporate <laughs> patients who are <laughs> stressed Perfect. out around. Yeah, we were stressed out around status and belonging and the Whitehall yep. study and that whole world. And so it's really started firing off some ideas for me. And so I started becoming very passionate about stress, which I, I hope to talk about at some length today um, as part of the idea of determinism as it relates to determinism. And then um, I found, uh, and, uh, not Andrew, uh, uh, Daniel Lieberman's book, The Story of the Human Body and Mismatch. And then, I was, then it went even deeper in terms of just the whole thing that we are and where we come from and, and what our experience and what our difficulties are. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how I've been noodling along in the world of alternative Chinese medicine, healing arts, but gradually finding my way supported by these wings of evolutionary science, primatology, uh, stress research, and letting that uh, really feed me. It's fed my life so deeply to understand how essential stress is in the story of who we are and how we experience ourselves. Good. Uh, well, yeah. We're on a very large same page, which is a good thing. Glad to hear that. Yeah. yeah. 
So uh, my opening question is um, this idea that there's no free will. You've written a 400 page book plus around it. And it's a great, I just want to say it out loud. I, I mean, I had a deeper purpose to this book, which was to have this conversation with you, which was a gift to, to go that deep and that slow and that many, uh, that, that deep with it. So this idea that we're determined, there's no free will. And I, I, the phrase that came to me is there go I, but for the, the chaoticism of distributive causality, it was like exactly. my way of summarizing it, right? There go Wonderful. I, not because of the grace of God, but because of emergent complexity and chaoticism and distributive causality. And I want to kind of ground that for people who are listening or watching in the idea that, you know, when I go to walk my dog in the morning and decide what's the best time to do that, <laughs> I'm not as in control. Or in fact, I'm not in control of that at all. So help us understand free will and or the lack of it, the myth of it. And you get bonus points for tying it into the PFC, adolescence, <laughs> um, and, and the butterfly effect. Okay. Well, marching orders. Um, I find the most useful thing is to start off by pointing out what most people think about is free will, what makes huge intuitive sense to people and where everybody goes off the rails and deciding that's fundamentally what we're about, which is this whole issue of intent. You decide you intend to do something. You know that you intend to do it. You know what the consequences are likely to be. You know you don't have to do it. You could do this instead or that instead. And if that all fits with your understanding of that circumstance, uh, what most people conclude from there is, yeah, I chose to do that. I'm responsible. I was culpable. I exercised free will. And in fact, in like every court of law in this country, uh, half of a trial revolves around, did the person intend to do what they did? And did they know they didn't have to, that there were alternatives? Okay, for me, where I start my whole rant is that is so myopic, that is so narrow focused, that is like being asked to review a book and all you've read are the last three pages of it because you have no idea what's going on. Because starting at the point of, ooh, did we intend to do that? Did we know it was going to happen? Did we know we didn't have to do it? We had intent. Starts at the very end because it is not addressing the question of, so where did that intent come from in the first place? How did you wind up being the kind of person who would intend to do something like that? For a very simple reason that no matter how hard you try, you cannot intend on what you're going to intend to do. You can't successfully wish for what you're going to wish for. You can't will yourself to have more willpower. It doesn't work that way. And instead, at those moments where we have come up with intent, that's the end product of everything that's come from a second before to a month before to a century before and all of that, because all we are is the end product of all that biology and environment <laughs> and their interactions over which we had no control whatsoever. I'm not going to resist that at all. What I'm going to, I'm going to accept it because in a large part, I actually do. There are, there are some obje objections I want to get to later, but okay. So we have no control over what we intend or what behaviors emerge out of us. It is a compilation of different strains of causality that are seamless. There's no break in them. Right. Exactly. And okay. they stretch back from like what your brain was doing a half second ago including what your prefrontal cortex was, currently my favorite part of the brain, to what hormone levels this morning had to do with how sensitive your brain was to the environment, to what your recent months have been like. Have you been traumatized? Did you find love? Did you find God? Did you solve Fermat's last theorem? Whatever, Because every single one of those would have changed the structure and function of your brain. 
And then back to like, what was your adolescence like? Because that's when you were last constructing your prefrontal cortex, your childhood, your fetal life, which is where your fetal environment was directing your brain construction, your genes, and bizarrely, like what kind of culture were your ancestors coming up with 500 years ago? Because that was influencing how your mother was mothering you for minutes of birth. And you put all those pieces together and it's not just, ooh, all these different disciplines tell us, oh, we've got no control over what's going on. All of these different disciplines are ultimately one discipline. Because if you're talking about genes, by definition, you're talking about their evolution over millions of years. If you're talking about genes, by definition, you're talking about your childhood, which had all sorts of epigenetic programming of your genes. And if you're talking about genes, you're talking about the proteins they specified in your brain this morning. And all of the pieces form one long biological interacting with environmental arc of making you who you are in this instant. And there's not a shred of space in there to squeeze in free will. So this gets to this idea around attribution and mistaken attribution. So I have a behavior. I walk my dog at a certain time in the morning, maybe a little bit later because it's raining today or maybe a little earlier because I have to get somewhere a little bit sooner. And I'm thinking I'm doing that. So in the distributive causality of a seamless world where everything is interconnected, how do you do proportionality in that? How do you know anything at all separating out and giving some attribution to it? And, and do you do that? And do you weight that? Like, how do you, how do you attribute that experience if everything is that seamless? Great. You attribute it very, very suspiciously, very skeptically. <laughs> um, I mean, a, a, a huge revolution, like in moral decision making in the last decade or so, is since, I don't know, time immemorial, the view was we think our way to a moral decision. And totally amazing research, a lot of it done by this guy, Jonathan Haidt at NYU, um, has shown no, actually, on all sorts of critical occasions, we feel our way to a moral decision. And then we use our conscious cognitive selves to come up with an explanation for why that makes perfect sense. Post hoc reasoning, and you can show this with brain imaging studies. You can show this by manipulating people unconsciously and they make different moral decisions than they would have otherwise. And then they do cartwheels to explain to you why this moral decision makes, oh, so much more sense than the very different one they gave three weeks ago when you weren't manipulating them. When you look at all of that, our conscious sense of how we are making our decisions, you know, every now and then that's kind of accurate as to what actually went on, but be mighty mm. suspicious if you assume your conscious awareness of where your intent came from is accurate. That's almost certainly not wrong, a lar not right a large percentage of the time. Mm -hmm. I think I have an example that recently in my life that explains what you're talking about, which is I've in my working out, exercising, I have never really enjoyed treadmills, but recently I was in Colorado working out with my daughter's boyfriend and there was a treadmill there that became part of our workout. And suddenly every day at the or two times a week, I found myself on the treadmill and enjoying all the features of the treadmill to know exactly, you know, and I thought I had this bias against like, yeah, I don't do these things because of movement. I don't want to have synthetic movement. I don't want to hurt my body. And there I was on the treadmill laughing at myself, knowing that my logical reasoning was actually pretty flimsy. And I just <laughs> needed a little bit of an emotional connection with it. And I was fine. Yep. And almost certainly some of the undercurrents there was you wanted to have your daughter's boyfriend think about how you were open to new experience and not completely calcified you have a respect for reconsidering your habits and thinking whether they're actually working for you how do you be the sort of person that like reflects on whether yeah this is how i do things does this actually make sense most people don't do that why did you care if your 
daughter cares if you like her boyfriend and if her boyfriend thinks you're you're cool and not set in your ways. Well, you know, all these things feeding into that. And you had nothing to do with how you became that sort of person. Yes. And I'm, we're going to come back to that. And I want to come back to the moral implications or the feeling sure. our way into an answer there and maybe some constructionism versus essentialism and Lisa Feldman Barrett kind of conversation. But I really want to give space. OK, we now accept our society accepts maybe the world or maybe some portion starts to see that we are biological beings. Probably most people's greatest fear just to accept that we are just <laughs> a biological experience happening. I've learned to do that in different ways in my life. And it's, it's given me a lot. One of it was starting to see myself as like, yeah, I'm in the primate family. I have primate motivations, just like every primate and that's okay. And yeah. actually if I start looking at primate issues and I start looking at the people coming in my practice and what they're talking about, they're talking about primate stresses or parental investment deficits or, you know, not being a, having a high value as a mate or wanting to have high value as a mate. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, that's, that's what's happening. So we're now we start accepting, we have this biology and we are this biology and we're not controlling it from some part of a free thing that's separate from it. But we have yeah. will, but we have will. There's, a, there's an expression and a phenomena of will, is there not? Well, there is, but my sense is it doesn't stand up to close scrutiny if we're saying exactly as you were just saying that there's a me inside there that somehow is separate of all this biology yuck that it's like, yeah, chemical and tissues and all that, but there's a me that's separate of that. And when it comes down to fundamentals, fundamental decisions, fundamental taste, fundamental whatever is, the me can step back from all of that. And in that context, the notion of will comes straight out of that. And there is no me that's separate from everything going on inside there. They're one and the same. It's just really hard to sort of deal with that much of the time. So what happens? What happens? How does society change? How do, how do you change? How do I change when we begin to um, let go of the myth of free will, some kind of separate me in there? Well, just to, just to kind of put that in perspective, um, I haven't believed in free will since I was an adolescent. I've been thinking this way for like half a century, Christ. And despite that, and despite it being very clear in my mind how one is supposed to behave, both like intellectual rationalizations and moral, um, in believing there's no free will, I managed to do that maybe 1% of the time. And the rest of the time, I'm a flaming hypocrite because just reflexively, I act as if there is free will and praise and blame makes sense when it actually doesn't in the slightest. If you really, really think about it, and when I really work hard at it, every now and then I could function as if that's the case. And if you really do accept there is no free will, none of us deserve any praise for anything whatsoever. None of us deserve any punishment. There is no entitled, entitled to a long, happy life, entitled to a long prison sentence. There is no deserve. There is no earned. There is no anything because none of us are anything more than the luck that brought us to the moment where we are. And if you really, really, really think that through, um, the two difficult consequences, one is you really can't blame anyone for anything, let alone you can't hate anyone. Hating someone makes as little sense as hating a virus that like wreaks havoc with your lungs or something. Um, so the first thing is it makes no sense at all to blame anyone, want to punish anyone, disapprove of them, hate them. And it makes no sense to be pleased with yourself about anything you accomplished because it's all the luck that you lucked out on and you, the you in there had nothing to do with it. And if you really put those pieces together, all we are is the biological circumstances that brought us to this moment and the environmental ones and their interactions, none of which we had any control over. If you really think about it, 
you do not deserve, you are not entitled to anything more than any other human on earth. You are not entitled to more consideration of your needs. Your voice should not be heard more. Your feelings should not be eliciting of more empathy or compassion because none of us earned it. Because all we are is what came before and we had no control over it, which is really, really, really hard to live that way. And as I said, like I fail dismally like the vast majority of the time, but every yeah. now and then I can kind of do it for a little bit. And I think that's a goal for everyone to try to aim for. Yeah. And it, it plays out. So the personal experience, which I've, I gathered from reading was part of your own, some, I'll just go there. Some evolved part of us or some cultural part of us is resistant to the idea that there's no free will. And it brings up one of the paradoxes is if there's no free will and everything is determined, how did the myth of free will emerge? Um, it emerged because we're smart and we can see more causality than any other species can. And that's often unsettling as hell. And like we can imagine the inevitabilities, like at some point your heart is going to stop beating and the blood is going to pool in your arteries and stuff like that. And we can do all that. And all of that stuff is totally terrifying and unsettling and agency yeah. is often a very good thing psychologically feeling as if you are not helpless or hopeless is a very protective thing in certain circumstances and thus we have a gigantic emotional incentive to feel as if we are the captains of our fates um, until we get punished for something that we in fact had no control over because the rest of society thinks that we in fact were captains of our fate in that circumstance. So you're starting to bring in the idea of stress a little bit because obviously the, the, the each evolutionary adaptation has a consequence. And so part of the intelligence and the ability to see causality in Homo sapiens is then becomes a a burden of sorts or an awareness of sorts. And so I think I hear you Absolutely. say that storytelling is part and attribution is part of the way we're making sense of it, but yet it's inherently somewhat problematic because it's storytelling. <laughs> yeah. And in the right circumstances, storytelling is great. It can be incredibly protective. Like you will invent a story you will say to somebody who is devastated by something that just happened, you will tell them a story saying to them, nobody could have stopped the car in time the way that little kid darted out. Yeah. And that may not have been the case. And that's an incredibly humane story. Or even if you had taken her to the doctor back when, they couldn't have done anything differently. Some of the most humane things we do is tell stories that deny agency. And all sorts of crossroads of mental health are built around being able to be self-deceiving in the right circumstances. Nonetheless, within this larger picture, we run a world on the notion that it's okay to treat some people way better than average because of things they had nothing to do with and other people way worse than average because of things they had nothing to do with. And this gets cloaked in this story that this is a just world and a just world built on this nonsense of we are the captains of our fates. And I want to touch on that a little bit more. I thought that would be more a little bit later on in the show, but you're talking about this motivation. I don't know if that's the right word anymore, but this motivation I feel in you, which is to speak back to the injustice. And so there's a, there's a, there's a social justice and a morality in this idea that people are suffering who don't deserve it and being blamed for it, who don't deserve it. And this came out later in the book when you talked about uh, the pain people feel, say, for instance, for being obese 
or mothers who were told that their schizophrenic children were the res responsibility of their mothering style. And, and, and for people to carry those kind of stories and the load of those kind of stories and what that does to a heart. And so I felt ultimately that there is a, a level of compassion in this story. And maybe this is what you mean by the best part of this, of writing the book was that ultimately not having free will is a good thing. What I felt there is this deep compassion for people who are unnecessarily unfairly suffering um, there. So I just I, I, I offer that out as a, a reflection back of something that moved me and see if you want to say more about that. Well, lest I start like coming off as some sort of social, social justice warrior, it just seems self-evident. There is something very screwed in the world that in this country, if you're born into poverty, there's, I don't know what, a 90% chance that you will be an adult in poverty. There's something very screwed in this world that like the stressfulness of the neighborhood you grow up in determines how many synaptic connections you're going to have in your prefrontal cortex and thus how good you are at impulse regulation. There's something screwed that if, I don't know what happened, you've got some facial asymmetry people when they're on a jury are unconsciously more likely to convict you than if you have a beautiful symmetrical face. What kind of fucked world is this? And that is not only all these things, but then we tell people afterward that this is a just world. And it's just self-evident that this stuff is not okay. And all that science has been doing is giving us the factoids that show more and more about why this is not okay. Yeah, I agree with you. One of my early experiences that's been, uh, and why I'm interested in, in biology and healing and health is that I see people suffer unnecessarily thinking that the feelings they have or the experiences they have are somehow their fault. And, and so these extreme or more extreme cases that somehow people are walking around believing that, you know, the cancer diagnosis is somehow their fault. You know, or, or, or their obesity is somehow their fault and, and the pain that comes along with that. And so one of my personal missions is, is a desire to see us be more at peace with our biological experience. And I felt that's kind of a thrust of your argument as well, that we can't go around causing suffering with free will stories of praise and blame and expect people to be okay and expect it to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for the first four out of the five years of writing the book, I was dreading getting to the last chapter because the punchline was going to be, yeah, this is totally unpalatable and it's a total drag that maybe you didn't really earn your, your fancy degrees or things you get patted on the head for. But that's the way the world works. Suck it up deal. And then realizing there was an interesting sort of filtering Anyone who's going to sit and listen to a podcast about whether or not there's free will, anyone who's going to be able to like have enough free time that they could read a book on the subject, anybody paying attention to any of this stuff, by definition, is one of the lucky ones because they're not homeless. They're not trying to get enough protein to get through it. They're not some warlord is not rampaging through their hamlet. They're not socially isolated because some unfortunate personality, whatever. You're one of the lucky ones if you could afford to be bummed out by the notion that you didn't earn the things you've been praised for. But for most people on earth, this is the most damn liberating thing imaginable because most people on earth are made to suffer in some way or other for things they had no control over and a huge amount of human misery is due to the fact that we see attribution where there isn't and realizing someone had nothing to do with how good their memory span is or whether they're overweight or whether they have an appealing personality or any or if the right skin color or the right height or the right ethnicity or whatever like there's an amazing amount of misery being promulgated out there by failing to recognize 
the extent to which who we are is the outcome of just random luck that we had no control over. And then we hold us responsible for it, for better or worse. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for saying all that. I appreciate that. Uh, let's get into this idea of randomness and luck. And I think maybe the way there is what, what do slime molds, bees, water molecules, and cortical neurons have in common? Well, they all show emergent complexity, which is to say they're all made out of like ridiculous, stupid little simple building blocks. And when you then put all those building blocks together, they suddenly can do stuff that's unimaginably complicated and adaptive. I mean, the the example that seems most like most amazes me is, you know, you take an ant and put it on a table and it runs around making no sense. And you put 10 ants there and they run around making no sense. And you put a hundred and I don't know, they kind of start interacting and but you put 10,000 of them and they build a society with like <laughs> role differences and they build nest systems that are air conditioned and and like amazing stuff and the most amazing thing is each individual ant is no smarter than when it was just like an ant wandering around alone on the table and what <laughs> emergent complexity is about is more is different with enough quantity you invent quality and you get all sorts of incredible stuff like why the wiring of the brain is 99 percent of the way to the most efficient possible pattern so you spend as little money as possible during brain development on wiring up your neurons exactly as telecom companies can do when figuring out how to spend the least amount of money on cables, you're solving traveling salesman problems. And the emerging thing is that our developing brains and telecom companies and ants all solve it the same exact way, which is amazing. totally cool and totally amazing. And slime molds do the same thing and they can solve mazes. They solve mazes in ways that are smarter than some rodents can be in lab settings. And all they are is made of a whole bunch of cells that know stupid, simple things about how they interact with the cell next to them and put enough of them together and out comes something adaptive and complex and That's often amazing. totally beautiful. And yeah, it's cool. It's very cool. It's very interesting. And, and, just to be clear, none of our brain neurons know the big pattern. They just do their thing where they are, right? It's not like they know or there's some kind of general knowing with emergent complexity. It's something that just emerges out of the small rules in the smaller parts of the system that then build into something they couldn't know individually. Exactly, because all the neuron yeah. knows about are the neurons in its immediate neighborhood. And the other 80 billion, who knows what they're up to, but put enough of them together and out comes stuff. And yeah, there's no blueprint. And not coincidentally in passing, thus, there's no blueprint maker. You don't need to invoke <laughs> one because if brains and societies are solving complex emergent challenges the same way yeah. that ants and slime molds and you know, molecules that form more complex molecules do. Um, nobody's got to sit there and weigh the different options and choose. They emerge. They emerge yeah. out of these complex interactions. Do you want to say anything about atheism in relationship to this? Is that, is, it seems like it's a setup for that. Well, I kind of think I just did about 30 seconds ago. Okay, in a good. Pretty <laughs> unsubtle way. I don't know. I've been for, for, decades I've been taking my students through chaoticism and emergent complexity and yeah. and how all this stuff, number one, can be understood, number two, but not on a reductive level, and number three, where you get like these same sorts of complex solutions in brains and societies and molecules and all of that, um, and you don't need a blueprint. And then charmingly, I say to my students, and oh, by the way, 
yeah, what that also means is you don't need a blueprint maker. And at that point, it's always a couple of weeks before I get emails from some students telling about how worried they are about my soul <laughs> or some such thing. But <laughs> the whole point of complex systems is yeah. there's nobody evaluating blueprints and there's nobody making blueprints. Which is such a helpful idea because it allows a kind of ground up reality rather than just always a top down. You know, and I think this gets into the idea of when people and I was wondering myself before I got into the book, what is determinism? Is it predetermined? And I think that takes us into the butterfly effect and the idea of chaoticism as a way to show the, what randomness and luck are and how that plays out. Yeah. Yeah. And the pitfalls that that provides, you know, chaoticism is totally amazing because it shows the world which we think we spend most of our time in, which is one where pieces add together in a linear way, additive, and by knowing a starting state of the system and knowing what the rules are for generating the second, third, fourth generation, you can sit there and you can extrapolate the, what the zillionth generation is going to look like without having to see what number two first looks like and number three and number four, and you could extrapolate. And that's like a nice linear reductive world. And then interesting stuff, yeah, is nonlinear, violates all of that. And you get systems that are by nature, by definition, forever and ever, how no matter how big of the magnifying glass you're holding, are going to be unpredictable, which is to say, if you start with a starting state and you want to know what it's going to be two steps from now, the only way to find out is to first go to step number one and from there go to step number two. You're never, ever going to be able to extrapolate. And this is what physics people deal with when they talk about three body problems. As soon as things get nonlinear, there's not predictability. People have just run wild at that point, deciding that chaoticism is the wellsprings, is the mother's milk of free will. That's obviously where free will can come from because it shows all these complex systems are unpredictable. And that's where the fatal mistake is happening. Chaotic systems, parentheses, all the really interesting stuff out there. Chaotic systems are by definition unpredictable but unpredictable is not the same thing as undetermined. And that's a world of difference. And the people who try to pull free will out of chaoticism, what they always wind up doing is mistaking predictability for determinism. Okay. That's clear. For people who want to do a deep, deeper dive, that's all really laid out in those middle chapters of your book where the pitfalls of trying to sneak free will back in because people are uncomfortable <laughs> with the idea that there's not free will for obvious reasons, for storyteller reasons. Um, okay, so I want to tie that into this idea of, uh, so this is the butterfly effect, right? There's this idea that, that what happens in one place can affect something that happens in the other is that connected to chaoticism or is that, was that a different idea? Yeah. No, absolutely. Okay. It, it, okay. it's sort of the flag bearer for it. I mean, we're very accustomed to, if you have a system that starts like X and ends like Z and like it's working like logical set of gears or whatever, if you change X a little bit, Z is going to change a little bit. And if you change X even more, that, that there's a point for point relationship there, that there's a predictability, that there's a linear relationship there. And what you see with nonlinear systems is the notion that the size with which X changes predicts absolutely zero about the size with which Z is going to change as a result. And what you get is, you know, iconically the butterfly effect under the right chaotic circumstances, a butterfly flaps its wings in Sri Lanka. And as a result, there's a tornado in Oklahoma three weeks from now that not only is there not a point for point linear relationship, but sometimes 
that discrepancy from this nice linear predictive stuff is like exponentially unpredictable and the flap of a butterfly and you got a butterfly effect then. Yeah. That's just this Should very I... catchy way of, of encapsulating this, this unpredictability and nonlinearity. So that brings me to this little side or kind of tiny sub area of this topic, which is the, the variation off predictability and this idea of strange attractors, which I found really interesting that uh, the, the rhythm of unpredictability has a rhythm or it has a, a, a orbit around something that makes sense, but never is predictable and yeah. still unpredictable. And so it's kind of this parallel reality emerging. And the, the way I wanted to ask this question is, is so if clouds and the weather system, because climate modeling is what kind of came out, this idea of where this emerged out of a meteorologist out of MIT, if I recall correctly, right? Yep. So yep. if Edward that's Lawrence. really un if that's really unpredictable and yet genes change at a fixed rate and people can tell how much time genes have changed or how much time has happened by the variation of genes, which feels like a clock to me. It doesn't feel like a cloud. So am I misunderstanding gene variability? Is gene variability really working on this same pathway as the unpredictable butterfly effect and, and strange attractors? Or is there another layer going on? Which is great. Um, what you have with, say, genetic evolution changes in gene frequency over time is, you know, a clock-like pattern. There is no actual clock in there with gears. There's just enough of this going on that statistically what emerges is a fairly periodic pattern. Um, but where the chaoticism comes in is, yeah, 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 there's a certain mutation rate but that has no power to tell you what the mutation is going to be. Because here's this little bit of UV radiation because you've been out frying in the sun for this length of time. And as a result, some, some little base pair in your DNA and your skin changes and becomes you know, the starts of a cancer and you're now barreling towards a melanoma. There's no way to know beforehand exactly which base pair that that like bolt of of you know ultraviolet radiation was going to hit and send it so that's where the randomness comes in you know okay. that on the average there's going to be a steady mutation rate that's going to give you no predictability as to what one individual population's mutation rate is going to be because there's going to be local conditions and it gives you zero predictability as to what kind of mutations there will be. Where the random stuff is going to have had a random effect. Say that one more time for me, that last conclusion. I kind of, I got lost. Okay. You could look at big populations and you could fairly predictably know the rate at which there will be mutations in this population and thus the rate at which evolutionary changes will occur. Given that, you are never going to be able to predict that for a small subpopulation because they're going to have sufficient special circumstances that mixes them okay. into the big statistical yeah. pop. Great. And moreover, yeah, yeah. you're never going to know, even on the populational level, what those random changes are going to be. Okay, here's here's an example of it. It's a total emergent feature of how bri primate brains work that like we got three times as many neurons as chimps do in our brains. And we even understand why that is like on a molecular level, which genes have something to do with that. And on a very like getting down to fundamental levels, if you want to turn a chimp into a human, just let its neurons divide three or four more times so that it's as big as a human brain as ours is. And at that point, you are absolutely certain because of emergence and complexity and chaoticism and all of that, that chimps are going to come up with theology. 
but there's no way in hell you can predict what kind of religion they're going to come up with or what kind of aesthetics or something <laughs> like that. Like it is guaranteed that emergent stuff like aesthetics and theology and ideology and economic are suddenly going to come out of chimps heads, but you're never going to be able to predict exactly which kind yeah, and yeah, what yeah. type of art is going to move them to tears. Amazing. So all, all just to say randomness dominates the, the, the random unpredictability of, of reality is at work. Is, is that of a fair sum? Yeah. yeah. And the randomness, lest one get all hysterical at this point about how quantum indeterminacy is a way in which you could sort of salvage free will from the rubble. Um, the randomness is the means by which you produce random behavior. And when we talk about free will, we're not talking about random behavior. We're talking about why this 50 year old who was just done something very moral and scary was doing that when they were in kindergarten. We're not talking about randomness. We're trying to explain the consistency that we call somebody's character. And is that is that attribution unfair is what you're saying that that's a misattribution or is there that consistency of these are the result of causality of gene environment interactions making me me and making that person them oh, what, are you, what are you saying right there oh absolutely it's the outcome of those and it reflects the fact that a lot of the ways in which our biology interacts with environment leaves a footprint that's going to stay there a long, long time. All you have to do is look at an 80 year old who still has PTSD from being traumatized and abused over and over and over as a child. You know, this stuff doesn't go away by chance. This stuff can even be multi-generational. So this biological randomness and its interactions with environmental randomness, like that stuff matters that stuff will last long afterward. Yeah, I, I mean, I could get really personal with that and kind of my own way of reconciling my adolescent development, but I'm interested in that pruning aspect of the PFC as it relates to say childhood adversity, as it relates to environments which are stressful at a toxic level, assuming that you don't believe every stress is toxic. There's just toxic forms of stress. There's healthy stress. I, 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 I hear you speak a lot about the uh, allopathic something model, but not the adaptive calibration side. And I've been aware of that, but I'm assuming that you're in concurrence that there is positive sides to certain kinds of stresses. Oh, absolutely. We, when it's okay. right, yeah. we love it. We pay. Yeah. We pay to get stressed. <laughs> we call it stimulation. Yeah. It's Excitement, the best. adventure, totally. Yeah. yeah great. It's, it's not too so, extreme. And it doesn't go on for too long. And yeah, and the in go oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and we know the worst outcome is like the roller coaster is gonna make you feel queasy afterward, not that it's gonna decapitate you. So it's like we're willing to give up some degree of control to be surprised in a setting that we overall find to be benevolent. And then we sit there and we say, yeah, surprise me with something, challenge me with something where I kind of sort of think I can do it, but I probably can't because I'm a loser, but maybe this time again. And that's the best when that's it. We love that. That's the greatest. And I'm in reward systems. I'm in adolescent development. I'm in the PFC and the pruning and the kind of shaping down and the reduction of unnecessary um, uh, unnecessary neurons that are not as instrumental in the deficit or the thinning of the PFC if you're in such adverse toxic kinds of stress where maybe the most essential thing is not to build a big PFC or I'm not exactly sure what the, what the logic there of that thinning is. And then I'm at the quarantine model a little bit. And, I, and so I'm in this kind of seamless feeling of, of where to go right now. And maybe you have a sense or a, a hit, but my hit is to go towards this PFC development, pruning issues, adolescent, wanting reward, wanting stress, wanting to become as an organism, wanting to you know pound the chest or wanting to... Uh, a fine self, be excited, be rewarded, experience life. 
And and then, yeah, so I'm right there. Maybe you would like to build on the PFC and the development of the PFC and the impact of that um, for our whole lives. Yeah, well, we're we're both obsessed with that part of the brain. Frontal cortex and the frontalist part of it is the prefrontal cortex. PFC, it's the coolest part of the brain. We've got more of it than any other species. It's the most recently evolved, all of that. And what does it do? It like makes us do the hard thing when that's the right thing to do. It makes us control our impulses and regulate our emotions and do long-term planning and gratification postponement. It does all of this like really cool, difficult stuff. And there's some really interesting implications of it. First one is it's the last part of your brain that fully matures not until you're about a quarter century old, which is most of your brain's wired up before you step into pre-K and your frontal cortex is still cruising along there being shaped by environment. Why is it? Because learning what counts as the right thing to do is pretty subtle. I mean, we all get taught when we're five years old that you don't lie It's not until you're 20 or so that you get pretty good at knowing, nonetheless, what things are you expected to lie about? What lies do your cultures uh, sort of recognize and value? You don't kill unless kill these sorts of people and then we'll give you a medal and all these complications. And it takes a long time for the prefrontal cortex to learn what counts as the right thing in different circumstances, because that's very complicated. The next interesting implication of it is if that's the last part of your brain that fully matures, by definition, it's the one that is least controlled by your genes and most sculpted by environment. And probably the the last thing that's most interesting to me in terms of long-term consequences have a stressful, toxic childhood full of adversity, all of that, and amid the consequences, and we know how that works in terms of which hormones and which neurons and which genes and nuts and bolts and all of that, among those consequences are your prefrontal cortex is probably not going to work as well as average. And for the rest of your life, at all those junctures where are you going to do the right thing, even though it's the harder thing to do, you're going to blow it over and over and over again. And what you could see is by age five, things like cumulative childhood stress is already a predictor of how fancy of a prefrontal cortex you're in the middle of constructing. This is like astonishing. Yes, 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 have childhood traumas and the die is not cast. It is not guaranteed that there's going to be bad outcomes. And it sounds like you're a great example of exceptions to that. But it's going to take a lot more work and it's going to take a lot more luck. And already it's an uphill battle for you. And yeah, things may turn out just fine. But everything about how the biology works is going to be tilting the playing field in the direction of you're going to have a hard time doing the tougher things forever after because not because you have a crappy soul and no self-discipline, but because (laughs) your frontal cortex developed with fewer synapses than it would have otherwise. Well, you probably won't be surprised to know I spent a lot of time in the principal's office. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I, I think you've made allusions to, I, I hope that was uh, good consequences rather than bad in terms of the sort of brain you got now. Right, right. So um, I appreciate all that. And I think where it leaves me is a little bit, I want to touch in for a few minutes on quarantine model as a solution for whoever it is, choices I make, somebody else who is working with uh, neurological deficits because of they're, they don't, it's determined. They don't have the resources. They don't have the neural lay down of control mechanisms. In this case, the dorsal lateral PFC versus the yeah. ventral medial PFC, right? Which have different functions. Yep, By the way, it. I very much a VMP uh, PFC type person. Like when I read that, I'm like, yes. And he loves the VMP PFC. I do too. I really appreciate the energy that comes through that. But, um, but so, so quarantine model, let's talk about that as a, uh, for a little bit around 
how we handle life differently rather than getting pleasure out of punishing people or inflating people's uh, sense of self? Well, people, as soon as you try to convince them there's no free will, um, and they either say, tough, I believe in free will, or they say, well, I don't know, maybe you're right, but I'm going to pretend as if there's free will. <laughs> the apoplexy that people get is immediately twofold. First one is, oh my God, you can't tell people that they're going to run amok. If people can't be held responsible for their actions, chaos, savagery, Hobbesian, troglodyte, brutish, nasty, short, all of that kind of thing. And there have been some studies where you take test subjects, psychology studies, and you give them something to read that biases people towards believing less in free will. And like right afterward, they cheat more. They cheat more if you then give them a game that they could play against somebody else. And there's the opportunity. Oh, my God, look at that. There's there's proof. If people stop believing in free will, like madness, we would all run amok because there's no constraints on us. And what happens is when you look more closely at those studies, there's something much more interesting going on. Don't get someone who believes in free will and you've just give them like a well-written passage of something to read that for 10 minutes make them think, huh, maybe it's got more to do with biology than I normally. Get somebody who shows up in your lab who already doesn't believe in free will, who hasn't believed in it for years. Get someone who has already done the thinking about, okay, if there's no free will, what are the sources of human goodness and human badness? And why are we here? And where meaning come from? And if you get someone like that, they're going to be exactly as ethical in their behavior as the person who believes most strongly in free will. Exact parallel, one that has been studied way, way, way more is sort of the, the troll cousin of the people will run amok if they stop believing in free will. People will run amok if they stop believing in God. Oh my God, there's nothing to hold you responsible for your actions. Atheists, by definition, have to be immoral individuals. And that's not the case at all. When you look closely, when you look at people who are stridently, stridently atheistic, parentheses, who have thought long and hard about where does goodness come from and why are we here and all of that stuff. When you look at those sorts of people, they are exactly as ethical and very highly so as people who are most stridently religious. It's the people in between who are more likely to cheat and steal and all of that. If you've thought hard and for long periods of time about these questions, it almost doesn't matter if your conclusion is, yes, we are the captains of our fate and should be held responsible, or yes, we are nothing more than the outcomes of our biology. If you've thought hard about it, you're almost certainly going to be a way above average ethical person. So that's the first thing that people have conniptions over. Oh my God, everybody's going to run amok. Okay, everybody's right. probably not going to run amok and, you know, only a subset of people will. But the second thing that people then get like crazed over at that point is, oh, my God, if you don't believe in free will, the few people who run amok, you can't do anything to them because it's not their fault. Ooh, you can't do anything to anyone, no matter how damaging and scary they are, because it's not their fault, which is ridiculous, which is asinine as a problem with it. No one for a second who says there's no free will says, you know, we should have murderers running around unencumbered. And we have a great metaphor for it. If you've got a car and its brakes don't work and you don't know how to fix the brakes, it is dangerous as hell. Don't let the car out on the street. Don't drive it. Put it in a garage and lock it up protect society from the uncontrolled dangers of that brakeless car. But that doesn't mean it's a good idea to every day go into the garage with a sledgehammer and slam the hood of the car and say, here's part of your punishment for being dangerous to pedestrians. You don't tell the car it doesn't deserve to get to drive in a nice park on a Sunday afternoon. You figure out the minimum needed to keep it from damaging people and you don't do a smidgen more than that, and you don't moralize. 
you use instead a quarantine model. And what the public health people do at that point is, you know, in addition to one, keep the person from being dangerous, two, don't do an inch more than you need to, three, don't sermonize at them, four, put some effort into figuring out where disease comes from in the first place, why breaks fail in the first place, why people become sociopathic in the first place. And when you put those pieces together, a sort of criminality, criminology yeah. version of a quarantine model, people yeah. are protected and you are protected from what's dangerous and you don't moralize into constraining more than that. And you try to figure out why some people turn out being uncontrollably violent. And if that sounds implausible, like there's a circumstance where there's a type of human out there who's dangerous, who's dangerous to people around them. If they are left loose to just do whatever they want and go about their usual business, they are going to damage different people, other people. And we have learned how to handle that. We've learned if your kid is sneezing a lot, don't send them to kindergarten tomorrow quarantine them. If your kid has a cold, keep them home because otherwise they're going to be dangerous. You keep your kid from damaging everybody else, but not one inch more than that. You don't tell your kid, ooh, you're bad. You can't play with your toys today while you're at home. You simply do the minimum that is needed to solve this biological problem. And then you figure out, ooh, why, why, why are kids getting so many colds this season? I you, know, you do your public health, deep causality sort of exploration. And while that may seem silly, it's the exact same model when you figure out why is it that some people are terribly damaging to those around them because of ways in which they were damaged developing. Make sure they're not damaging and don't do an inch more than that. And there is no pain that they have earned. There is no retribution that is morally acceptable. Do the absolute minimum. Minimum. Don't preach to them and figure out why society produces dangerous people like that if they have crappy circumstances when they grow up. And you protect people. And all you've done in the process of subtracting responsibility out of it is make the place if anything, safer than our current retribution-run prison system does. And you make it a much more humane place. It's a very good thing when people are not punished or having nose colds or the moral equivalence of. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I have a, a kind of a paradoxical question around who decides, you know, in this situation, who decides... Uh, what danger or harm is and maybe it's maybe it's the same rules i don't know but there's like okay you have biological beings who are determined who are under the same rules of determinism and yet you're asking how do you get that structure how do you get that decision to take place yeah who gets to decide that's that's yeah. like the problem that comes <laughs> up every once time someone says Wow, bad parenting is so consequential. They should give out licenses. You shouldn't be allowed to parent unless you have a license. Uh, who gets to decide, you know, like, you know, parenting licenses and such? Who gets to decide that? That is way, way outside my pay grade. Um, but right. what seems clear is, nonetheless, we should take comfort from exactly the sort of things you mentioned before. Each time we figure out you know, your kid is not evil because they're sneezing on the kid next to them in the playground. And yeah. when we figure out someone is not evil, if they have this type of brain damage, each time we do that, um, you know, the world gets better. The world gets more humane. And we got to yeah. just keep striving to do that something lurking between the lines there is while i'm sitting here going on about oh so you got to get rid of the entire criminal justice system and it never makes any sense to blame someone punish someone retribution makes no sense just quarantine models at the same time there's the exact same demand that you get rid of meritocracies because that's a system by which people feel more entitled by which people wind up being treated in more entitled ways. 
because of things they had nothing to do with. There's like no justification for a meritocracy also. And at that point, the way somebody then panics is saying, oh my God, if there's no free will, the murderers are going to be running around in the streets and some random person is going to be grabbed to operate on your brain when you have a brain tumor there. No, you construct society so that dangerous people can't damage other people. And you construct society so that competent people turn out to be the neurosurgeons. But... You don't construct a society in which they are made to think that they're a better, more worthy human because they got a good memory for factoids and good motor skills with their hands. You don't construct a society in where somebody's value and where your rationale for deciding that somebody's needs are less, less worthy of consideration than yours are. There's no room for that. Yeah. Well, I think that's a pretty good argument uh, about why the benefits. I'm thinking about someone in prison. I'm thinking about the stress they go through, the additional stress, feeling bad about their decisions or or like they have a bad soul or that kind of narrative and how that's just going to exacerbate the whole situation. Uh, I guess what I'm thinking a little bit for me when I read it, I thought, you know, the quarantine model's good. But I also feel like there needs to be next to it like a repair and a restoration model, right? Because if we just ask people to just, well, okay, you stop, you're, you're going to harm people. But where is that opportunity for learning? Where is that opportunity for growth? And I think I want to end the show going this direction, which is about change and what that motivation of change is in us that's still there. Even if it's not determined, it's still happening. I mean, it's not uh, me doing it free will. It's still manifesting. It's still showing up. There's still some deep, homeostatic motivation to I don't know, make things better for lack of a better word right now, but to improve, to grow, to be heartful. And um, I just feel like my, the, the one thing that I have in my objection list I want to add into that is, and it gets back to the John Haidt thing about this part of us that makes decisions. And then we afterwards, we tell ourselves a story about it. Right. It's, we, we give a, a post hoc res, re, rationalization of why we did what we did, but not really knowing exactly. For me, when it gets into this biology stuff is part of my work or part of how I think about it is I accept myself as a brainstem. Like I'm like, I'm not just the things that I know and that I aware. I am this coalescence. I am this vector. I am this thing. It's a biological being. And I, I may not know everything and why everything's happening below what I can't see, but it's there, it's happening, and it is me. And it's it's my experience of me, I should say. And, and that there's a vector, there's a force that in addition to any adversity that I might experience, there's a responsiveness and there's a, I don't want to call it good, but there's something that's coming out that wants to generate restoration. There's something that wants to come out that wants to red, uh, generate betterment that's part of the deterministic makeup. And I find that actually hopeful. I find that actually like, oh, deep down there is a, a responsiveness to life. And where that comes from is a, is a really deep question. And how that is, is is a really deep question, particularly if there's no free will around it, why that's part of it. I kind of go towards the strange attractors. But... Um, I'm going to leave that for you to pick up and, and, and add to it or respond to it in what way it makes sense to you. Well, you're, you're tapping into like the third leg of the stool of what, what people go crazed about when saying there's no free will. Um, you know, we're all going to run amok. Even if only a subset of us do, we're just going to let them run amok and not do anything. The third one is, Oh, if there's no free will, nothing can change. That's the wrong kind of determinism. That's that's pilgrims with buckles on their shoes, Calvinist predeterminism. Um, a deterministic world um, is not remotely ruling out the possibility of change. Obviously, because massive change happens around us all the time. Somebody becomes a white supremacist. Somebody stops being a white supremacist. Somebody decides they've got a different flavor of ice cream they like. Whatever, entire cultures change. You know, change happens all over the place. Where you get into trouble, though, if you reject the idea of free will, is the notion that you decide to change. 
what happens instead is circumstances have made you into the sort of person that the circumstances that occur around you right now cause you to change in this particular way. Okay, let me give, give, give an example of that. Um, you know, you, you go to some movie, what was that one, a few years ago, that uh, conscientious objector in World War II who famously went and saved like 40 guys in the battlefield and unbelievable risk that he took and like incredible heroism. And like one person comes out in the movie saying, that was amazing. That was am seeing that one person could be like that. I feel like, you know, I'm going to go figure out something to do to try to make things better. And the second person comes out and says, oh, my God, that's amazing cinematography. Who's the cinematographer? I'm going to go look at a whole bunch more movies by that guy. And the third person comes out and says, oh, my God, that was the most manipulative, treacle and cheesy, emotional sort of control there. God, heavy handed. You know, I'm going to see what other movies this person has made. And that's the last one of theirs I ever see. <laughs> Whoa. Same exact environmental experience. How did those three people come to be the three sorts of people where they would be changed by that circumstance? Parentheses, what we would incorrectly say is they changed after seeing the movie. How did they wind up being three people who were changed in such different ways because of everything that happened up to the instant before that that made them who they are? I want to, since there's a couple more minutes here, I want to talk about hunter gatherers a little bit. And I, one of the questions that kind of meanders through my mind being in the modern situation is how much of what you're writing about and how much of what we're dealing with about trying to figure out distributive causality and who we are and what's going on and what's the right place for our ego and our sense of self is is in large part a, an artifact of of the world we live in today and would not necessarily have been necessary by any means a quarter million years ago 80,000 years ago 30,000 years ago absolutely um you know the the realm of metabolic disease Looks like we're breaking up a little bit. oh is that any better yeah say that again Okay, the realm of metabolic disease is like perfect for doing all of your evolutionary mismatch, mismatch arguments. 99% of hominid history, we were out fighting for every calorie, all of that sort of thing. And then along yeah. comes westernized diets and we have right. this thrifty metabolism and we're all getting type 2 diabetes now. And the same thing acts as well with like mental health. For 99% of human history, we had no idea how much pain there was on the planet or understood like the ice caps are melting. right? Now. And that same capacity to perceive the future and all that now is causing tidal waves of depression and anxiety. And in this realm, the exact same thing. The notion that you could sit there and decide, so what do I want to be when I grow up? That is such a recent westernized luxury. <laughs> Forget talking about humans 80,000 years ago. Talk about humans on most of this planet. Yeah. Not that long ago, you wind up with whatever you lucked out with. If you inherit your parents' cows or goats or camels, that's one version of it turning out okay. If they're so poor that they sell you to somebody who basically works you through an apprenticeship at like doing 80 hours of manual labor a week. That's how you turn it. Yeah. All of this is predicated on a very, very privileged westernized sense and middle class to upper class sense of having options. Mm. And it's in that context that, ooh, you actually have no free will. Tell somebody that, ooh, you know, there's actually much less free will than humans normally think. And they wound up being a grave digger because their father and their grandfather and all of that for centuries were grave diggers in their little village. Um, they've never thought about the concept of free will. Fatalism is much more the human experience. 
you know, it's very recently that we can afford to have people getting pissed off at each other about whether there's partial free will or no free will or libertarian free will, let alone people like getting tenure at universities because of that. <laughs> this is like a very new realm of the human experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've been thinking this way for a long time, right? You've been thinking there's no free will. The, the world's determined and it's a, a blueprint list and a blueprint maker less world. I uh, want to close out with an invitation. You can accept it or not. But my experiences in the realm of health and healing is oftentimes we become the people that we need. It's part of this like homeostatic wisdom in the system, I think, that we didn't that weren't there when we needed them. And I, my, my question and invitation for you is now at this point in your life, if you could be there for that, you know, 13, 14 year old distressed young adolescent who was reconciling his sense of what this journey of life was about, what would you, what would you say to him? Well, I would have all sorts of useless platitudes about how when I was his age, because when I was his age, and almost certainly I was making horrible decisions, um, I mean, the undercurrent of it all is, you know, this adolescent existential despair, you know, Woody Allen sitting there saying, the universe is expanding and look how tiny I am. And, and doctor, that's all he's saying. What's wrong with him? Can't you give him medication? You know, when we realize how big it is, and how indifferent it is and how pointless we are and all of that. You know, the only advice I would give is, yeah, 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 there's no purpose. And yeah, you're right. What you just figured out the other night at two in the morning, you're just a machine, you're a biological machine, but you're a weird one because when your machine thinks it's feeling something, it feels as if those feelings are real. And it feels if, as if it feels as if it feels that those feelings are real and all of that. And that's what you're stuck with. You're this totally weird kind of machine. And the feelings thus feel real enough that assume they are real. And thus pain is like something that there should be less of. And it's a good thing if you do stuff to lessen it. And even though in the long run, it doesn't matter you're this weirdo machine who can't tell the difference between what it, what's real and what it feels like that something is real. So go with it. Yeah, that makes sense. I love that. Thank you so much, Robert Sapolsky. I'm sure. uh, so very grateful to have your time today and for you to share the depth of thought and work behind this book. It's a great book. I encourage everybody to listen to it, read it, Audible, whatever it is. And I appreciate your time today. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Take care, Jeff. You too.